Thank you. There we go. I'm going to ask our three special guests to sort of wave at us and identify themselves so that everybody can see them and find them. Daitsu, are you out there? And can you wave at us? There he is. Arthur, how about you? <laughs> do we see do we see somebody waving? Um, I see Arthur. <laughs> we don't see Arthur. Arthur had said, I will get there if I can, and so we may see him. He may come in a bit. And Michael, are you out there that we can see you? <laughs> I can't see everybody on the screen, so I'm hoping I saw him. I saw Michael earlier. Okay. So maybe they're gonna die. So you might be the only one here right now. <laughs> I'm gonna do a speak of you. No? Pardon me? Speak of you? No? So we can see their face before? When they're talking, yes. yes that's okay. But yeah, if I'm simply okay. asking people to wave, then we're not gonna see that's them. But okay. yes, for us here in the Zendo. There's Daisu. So Daisu, since we have you here, before I start peppering you and others start peppering you with questions, uh, is there anything you'd like to just start by saying, things you'd like us to know, or anything that's sort of at the top of your mind right now? <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. I did not ask these guys to prepare a Dharma talk. I just said, let's have an informal conversation. So what would you like us to kind of know right off the bat? Hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the first thing that was on my mind when I thought about um, being with you today is uh, a talk that I had with Uchiyama Roshi. Uh, let's see. So it just could have been about 19, uh, about 1991 with Roshi. He, uh, he had turned 81. He'd become, uh, he was 81 years old. And um, he said to me that day, you know, I'm, uh, I'm now 81 years old. And I think I'm just beginning to understand Buddha Dharma. <laughs> 81. I'm just beginning to understand Buddha Dharma and practice. Well, I'm only in my late 70s, so I'm not there yet. <laughs> I've only been practicing for 50 some years, so I've got a long way to go. Um, <clears throat> a, um, a good friend of mine, uh, who I see on the screen, uh, Tonin O'Connor, uh, there she is, um, uh, is a longtime practitioner as well. And um, uh, if I goof up, I know she will let me know. <laughs> Thank you. <Tony. laughs> I don't see uh, Okamura Roshi. Is he? Uh, is Shohak Sam he, here? He, he's behind me. So I should say Okamura Roshi is joining us in the Zendo tonight. However, he was very clear with me. He is not a panelist. <laughs> he is not taking questions tonight. He's just a guy. <laughs> so yes, he was as curious as the rest of us to know what would we, you know, say tonight. Uh, but he's working behind me <laughs> or backing me up. However, you want to look at that. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I'm going to say if anybody sees Arthur or Michael, somebody please send up a flare because I don't want to ignore them if they're here or they may be in and out. Um, let's just make sure not to not to ignore our opportunities with the other two. Um, okay. So I wonder, Daitsu, if I could throw out the first question for you um, as you think about what you've learned from Uchiyama Roshi and the time that you spent with him. Is there something you wish we in North America understood better about his practice, about what he was trying to do, uh, about what, what he would want us to carry forward uh, here at Sanshin, but just in general? Do you have some thoughts about that? Mm.
And perhaps there's something we misunderstand that you'd like to correct. Uh, Uchiha Maroshi's uh, practice was a practice of sitting. Um, <clears throat> I never learned how to chant a sutra at Antaiji. Uh, I, I never, we, we didn't do any ceremonies uh, at Antaiji. Um, during sessions at Antaiji, um, the um, practice in most monasteries is that uh, the abbot sits uh, facing, not facing the wall, faces uh, the rest of the practitioners, uh, which Amaroshi refused. He always turned and faced the wall. He said, if I have to sit the other way, then how can I practice if I have to be watching everyone else who's sitting? So he said, when he practices, he practices facing the wall, always. <clears throat> that was one thing. Um, <clears throat> I remember my first session at Antaiji. Um, I've been kind of thinking about that all week. <clears throat> it was in um, December 27th, I think, was the first time I went to Antaiji. Uh, and um, I met <clears throat> Uchiha Maroshi that day, and we, we talked a, a little bit. My Japanese wasn't really um, much of anything uh, even then. Um, but um, uh, he said, you're welcome, and um, uh, please uh, stay for the five days. Well, <clears throat> the... Um, the first day I sat, uh, I remember uh, my knees were closer to my chin and my shoulders than they were to the floor. <laughs> An incredible pain in both knees. Uh, and uh, during the second day, both knees and my back and shoulders. And the third day, I don't think there was anything that didn't hurt. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, the fourth day, um, about just about uh, Xing Day, the time to get up. Um, <clears throat> the senior monk at that time, Watanabe Koho Roshi, uh, came in, took one look at me, and he said, "Go back to bed." <laughs> he says, "Don't get up," because I look so miserable. I suppose. So the fourth day, I rested, and uh, on the uh, fifth day, I finally was able to uh, finish the uh, session um, and um, talk with, uh, with Roshi afterward. And the following morning, when I left on Taiji, I swore I would never go back to that refrigerator. It, it, I was freezing the all, all the whole five days and in pain the whole time, um, and I uh, I thought, well, maybe there are some um, uh, macho dudes who, who can do that, but uh, I I'm definitely not one of them. Well, uh, winter turned to spring. Spring uh, became summer. It became warm again. Um, I had been, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd been living in Hokkaido, in Sapporo, for um, two years as a lay missionary uh, of the uh, one of the Lutheran denominations. Um, and I finished uh, my contract with them. So uh, I went, decided to go back to Antaiji just to uh, meet Uchiha Maroshi again. Um, so I hitchhiked from uh, Sapporo uh, down to Kyoto. Actually, I, I hitchhiked all over Japan uh, in my early 20s. Um, I, I went all over the country uh, hitchhiking because I didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and um, I never had any trouble hitchhiking. Um, everyone picked me up. 
Um, some people picked me up because they just wanted to speak English. Some people were just surprised to see a foreigner um, uh, sitting. One guy picked me up, uh, took me home for dinner. And um, on the way, way to his house, he said, um, oh, and, and would you sleep with my wife tonight? Um, he he uh, uh, was very open. Of course, I didn't. But um, uh, he um, fed me and then put me back on the road the next day. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I went back down to uh, Kyoto and to Antaiji. And um, uh, I was living in a, uh, a, a, a tiny apartment um, it was about, uh, maybe an eight mat room apartment. Uh, it had a, a sink and it had a, something like a, like a toilet. Um, it was, uh, the honey truck would come by, uh, once a month to, um, uh, take out everything. Um, it, it was just tiny, and I, I was looking, uh, I remember how much I paid for it, and I was looking at that um, the other day, and I think I paid tw $26 a month for the rent. That was expensive at that time. Um, and I went to see uh, uh, Uchiha Maroshi on a daily basis. Uh, so I lived in Antaiji itself for about three months and then moved into this apartment. And um, I probably saw Uchiha Maroshi um, once a month, um, for the most part, for the next 25 years. Um, I uh, uh, would go to see him and... Um, I would take a question to him. I had something that would come up in my practice. He would reply to my question. And then there was always something he would add. And so I went home satisfied that my question had been answered. And then I would think, yeah, he also said this. And, um, I'd begin to think about that. And out of what he had said, another question would come up. And I would take that question back to him again. He would reply and always add something that wasn't a part of my, for my question. Well, <clears throat> what I realized over the years, what he was doing is that he wanted us always to ask the bigger question. Always ask the bigger question. A lot of times <clears throat> in the early years of our practice, um, different, different things come up, different um, problems, mostly head problems uh, come up. And we work on the head problems. <clears throat> but finally, our practice is obviously not one of a head practice. Our practice is physical, it's sitting, and it's letting go, constantly letting go of whatever comes up. Um, that was that was one thing that um, he he taught me through uh, through his words and through his own practice. Um, <clears throat> so one, always asking the bigger question that was important. Um, there were. <clears throat> Uh, a lot of people who came to see Roshi, Aoyama Shundo Roshi was one uh, with whom he uh, was in contact. And uh, the two of them often had conversations. Uh, Mizuno Yaoko um, 
who was a uh, was a Buddhist uh, professor, uh, scholar, and practitioner, uh, was one whom Roshi would often write to and ask questions about Shobo Genzo. And she would reply to Roshi's questions. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, Roshi wasn't just reading uh, himself. He had other people too, with whom he was uh, talking uh, uh, to deepen his own understanding of our practice. Um, Lots of, of different uh, people came to Antaiji in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Michael uh, was one of them. Um, Arthur was another. There was um, uh, Steve Yenick, uh, who was also very uh, one of the early practitioners at Antaiji and who um, uh, with, with whom I we, I translated approach to Zen, the uh, predecessor to um, opening the hand of thought. Um, Steve and I were able to put that book together uh, thanks to um, uh, Suzuki Daisetsu's secretary, um, who also came to Antaiji to talk with uh, Uchi Amaroshi uh, 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 occasionally. And she said, oh, I'll help you. And she found a, a publisher that would publish uh, uh, the book for us. So we were able to get that uh, uh, published. And then later, um, uh, uh, Jisho, Kerry Warner, and, and of course, uh, Shohak San also <clears throat> uh, translated, worked on translation of Opening the Hand of Thought. Um, <clears throat> There was, uh, I re recall a couple of people. Um, there were Europeans, there were Americans. Um, people were coming to Antaiji all the time. Um, and I sometimes I'd have to um, uh, interpret for them. And um, so I was either I or one of the, one of the other um, foreigners who had, was around that area, uh, in the area there. Uh, would translate for for this person. Uh, we'd ask them, "Well, how long do you think you'll be here?" Oh, I think uh, I think I'll stay about uh, five to ten years. Oh, I see. That's nice. Well, usually the uh, the people who said that would usually be gone in about three days. Yeah, yeah. Um, that happened frequently. Uh, they just. Uh, it was too much. We had uh, one fellow that I uh, can I can never forget, who um, was from Iran. <clears throat> he said he walked across Iran and China, and then eventually got to Japan, and uh, came up to Kyoto, and. Um, I don't know how he knew where I lived, but he 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 wanted to talk to me. So I said, sure, I'll, I'd be happy to. He says, well, well you know, I'm um, I, I I'm already enlightened. Um, I was told that by Benke, um, who's who was long dead, <clears throat> um, that uh, I I'm already enlightened, and I just want to confirm it with Uchiyama Roshi. Oh, I see. Okay. So I took the man in um, uh, to Roshi's room. And uh, in Japanese, I um, prefaced my uh, interpreting by saying, Roshi, uh, try not to laugh at this guy. Um, you'll understand why when I explain. And then I said, he think he feels he's enlightened. And Uchiyama Roshi listened uh, very straightforwardly, didn't laugh, he didn't, wasn't uh, uh, condescending, and it was never condescending, but uh, listened to the man. And then he asked him, well, um, why do you think you're enlightened? And he said, well, um, 
I can be in a noodle shop and I can be um, eating noodles and watching television uh, at the same time. I can do two things at once. Oh, and I can tap my feet, three things at once. Oh, I see, Roshi said. Well, if that's the case, then maybe um, the, the jugglers in, a, in the circus would be the most enlightened, wouldn't they? And the guy thought about that um, and didn't comment on it. Well, we left. <clears throat> and um, subsequently, the, the, the fellow uh, uh, went uh, to California, went, went on to California. And the last thing I heard was that he had been institutionalized in uh, some uh, institution in California uh, for a couple of years. Um, we, we had all kinds of people who came to sit at Antaiji. Um, there were sometimes people who came <clears throat> um, to sit uh, and uh, they would be talking about why they wanted to sit and the problems, the psychological problems they were having. And sometimes uh, Uchamaroshi uh, said, well, I don't think you should sit right now. I think what you should do is I think you should uh, see um, perhaps a, a, a psychologist or someone who can help you with these mental problems you're having and then come and sit with us. He was saying um, we don't sit to uh, just to uh, get our head straight, in other words. Um, that was um, one. Uh, there, in other words, every he did not recommend everyone who came to Antaiji to oh yes, come and sit, come and sit, come and sit. Uh, it wasn't like that. Um, there was uh, another uh, young fellow, an American. This guy was an American, and um, he thought zazen was important. So he he moved in to Antaiji, which Amaroshi said, fine. And he sat with us, and we would sit somewhere between five to nine hours a day at Antaiji. Uh, but he didn't think that was enough. And so after the evening zazen would finish at nine, <clears throat> most, most of us would uh, go to our rooms or wherever we were, and um, to study um, or, or go to bed. Well, this guy began sitting, and he would sit till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. And he'd be up at 4 in the morning again, sitting again. Um, eventually, uh, which, uh, well, even when during work periods, this guy thought it was more important to sit zazen, so he wouldn't even participate in the work periods. And this um, was a, a bit too much. Uh, and so Uchi Amaroshi said, no, I'm afraid you, you're going to have to leave. I suggest, why don't you go to Eheji? Oh, okay. So the young guy went to Eheji, and um, after about one week there, he decided uh, they weren't sitting enough at Aheji. And he started doing this same thing. And he would sit after everyone else had gone to bed. Well, when he did this over a period of a couple of months, um, finally, uh, the people at Aheji uh, called the person who had introduced him to come and get him. So the priest <clears throat> went to pick this guy up and take him home. Uh, I won't mention who it was because <clears throat> most of you would know the name uh, as soon as I said it. But um, anyway, uh, this fellow, um, uh, after 
being taken from Aheji uh, to this temple, began sitting there. Well, he began sitting 24 seven. He, he wouldn't move uh, out of position or, or once in a while he would get up and then sit back down again. <clears throat> That's when um, the, uh, the priest of the temple uh, purchased a one-way ticket and he was sent back to the States where he was <clears throat> institutionalized for a couple of years. After, subsequently, he um, he got much better, and um, re, re, he, in his case, he recovered, um, and um, I probably still sits today, but not twenty four seven. Um, sometimes, uh, when I would visit Uchamaroshi, we would um, go for a walk. He he liked to walk in the late afternoons, so I'd go with him um, just in case uh, we would go along the the um, uh, the Uji River. He walked along the Uji River, and uh, I wanted to be with him because uh, he, if he fell, um, and there were places that were not uh, not so easy to walk through, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to be with him. And so we would walk together. Um, <clears throat> or sometimes we would go to a local noodle shop together. He, he liked, he liked noodles as well. Um, oh yeah. Um, another thing about Uchamaroshi is he always thought <clears throat> he was rich he was very he, he felt that he was rich he he, he had <clears throat> maybe uh, he was getting a little uh, uh royalties from some of his books but japanese uh publishers don't pay uh their uh, the writers and translators anything like <clears throat> what they do in the states uh, but he, he that he thought that was enough for him to to live on and and probably was um maybe maybe i should uh stop and and perhaps out of what i've said or, or perhaps uh unrelated to what i've said uh maybe there are some questions or maybe michael has something Michael or Arthur have something they would want to add. So are we unmuted here? Sorry. Okay. So yes, I do want to just check and see if we've seen Arthur or Michael, and if somebody can wave or set up a flare or <laughs> so indicate. Maybe not. Okay. Yes, uh, they're they're both here. Good. Where? <laughs> I don't think Arthur. I don't think Arthur is here. Oh, there's okay. But Michael's here. Good. So, Michael, welcome. Uh, so, I want to just give you also the opportunity to say anything that you'd like to say. Um, you know, and just in the beginning, I was thinking as we got underway, I wanted to give each of you a chance to say whatever might be uh, foremost in your mind at the moment before we start peppering you with questions. Uh, and I was also asking Daitsu, you know, if there were one or two things he thought uh, we should be paying particular attention to in terms of Uchiha Murashi's legacy either here at Sanchen or just sort of in North America. But let me just give you the space to say whatever you'd like to say to us at the moment. Yeah, I gotta say, I don't really, um, I, I do better when I respond to questions, I think. Okay, that's fine, because I'm sure people have questions for you. <laughs> so uh, since I have you here, I, I'm gonna throw a question at you. When you first encountered Uchiha Maroshi and when you were practicing together, was there anything that particularly surprised you or dismayed you, you know, I think as North Americans, we arrive in that sort of container and in that sort of circumstance, and we think we know what we're stepping into, and we often don't know what, you're, what we're stepping into. What was the thing that maybe surprised you the most? Um, gosh, that's a good question. Can you, you can hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I never really learned Japanese very well. I mean, I was there for many years, but uh, 
Um, I didn't really have private conversations with him and um, with Uchi on the Roshi. Um, yeah, I, I was directed, you know, when I arrived uh, in, in Kyoto, I was directed uh, to um, a, a teacher, you know, a painting teacher who I worked with for, for, for a long time. And I would always join the uh, sashims at Antaiji. And um, that was the only time I really got time off from uh, working with uh, my mentor, who is the painter. Okay. Um, so I hear or see in the chat that also Arthur is here, and I want to give us a chance to sort of say hello to him. Um, can, um, can ask to unmute. So apparently Arthur's muted. If you want to unmute Arthur and join the conversation, <laughs> if there's something you'd like to share off the top of your head with us. Arthur is here. Yeah, we're going to get him to unmute if we can. Hmm. <laughs> He's maintaining a dignified silence at the moment. Yeah. Maybe you could direct him on the screen then down in the bottom. Arthur, can you hear me? Probably can. Oh. Oh. Arthur, um, down in the bottom left of your screen, there's a mute sign. You got to unmute. <laughs> it takes a village to unmute one practitioner. Here he is. Ask to unmute. Technology is a wonderful thing most of the time. Arthur, how'd you figure this out? All right. While we're working on that, let me see if anybody, uh, let me start with people in the room. Uh, to see if anybody here has a question for any of these three guys. If we can unmute Arthur, we'll add him to the list. Questions in the room immediately from anybody? Tell, uh, say again, please. Yeah, I was just curious uh, what kind of sense of humor uh, UGM uh, Roshi had, and if anyone recalls any particular you know, examples. Of ah, okay. So any of our three guests, you want to jump in on that? What kind of a sense of humor UGM Roshi had? Wow. <laughs> he yeah, he he did. He he did have a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> he was really um Hey, there's Arthur. <laughs> 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 the victory is ours. There he is. <laughs> there we go. I can see me too. That's cool. All right. <laughs> and I do say hand up online. We'll get to you momentarily. That so that's that's fine. Okay. Uh, so be mute. Okay. So I'm gonna say, Dice, um, if you want to finish your thought there, and then let's come back to Arthur so we give him a chance to say whatever he'd like to say, but you're sort of mid-thought, so, so let me not interrupt you. Um, he, he, he didn't joke. Uh, he didn't really joke at all. I don't recall him ever you know, talking, uh, speaking in that way. Um, I suppose, I suppose what um, comes to my mind mostly is um, times that I would uh, visit him when he had, I got, I went into his room and the entire floor of his room was spread open, or spread out with um, uh, the history of Buddhism, in India uh, and China, and he had this all mapped out. He had it all, all uh, you could see it all. Um, and he was pointing out all of these things. Oh, I do remember one time though, <clears throat> when I went to see him, 
he had a um, um, a rather beaten up um, copy of Zuimonti. And um, I, I kind of kidded him. I said, uh, Roshi, don't you think it's about time uh, to buy a new copy of, of Zui Monkey? It, um, it, the cost was like, um, you know, what, maybe $2. You could buy it for about two bucks. Um, he, he looked at me and he, he pointed over my shoulder. He says, look behind you. And I turned around and on the shelf behind me, there were 14 or 15 copies of the Zui Monkey that were all beaten up. <laughs> he had gone through that many copies of Zui Monkey, 14 or 15 copies. Uh, that that stuck with me. Um, we, Arthur, what about you? Is do you remember anything? Arthur, did he did he did he disappear there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Arthur, are you still there and listening and and speaking? <laughs> He may be checking on something. Sure. Well, he's there. I mean, he's, yeah. he's yeah. got an open, we've got an open link anyway. Arthur, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, one thing I remember that Uchi Amaroshi um, um, said over and over, he always thought, um, he never thought of himself as being poor. He always uh, thought himself as a very rich person. Uh, oh, uh, you remember uh, hearing that from uh, Uchiyama Roshi? Arthur, unmute. <laughs> Arthur, no. uh, there you are. I, I, went, I left for a minute. Can you repeat it? Oh. Um, <laughs> What did I just say? <laughs> so the, the open question at the moment is what Uchi Amaroshi's sense of humor was like. Arthur, do you have any stories or recollections you'd like to share? Arthur, do you remember anything about when, when meeting Uchi Amaroshi that struck you? Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I came to Ankaiji after sitting a session with at another temple. That was a lot more formal. So the thing that struck me, I guess, was how informal, how natural he was, and what a relief that was for me. But uh, other than that, I don't remember any jokes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so Arthur well, he did have a sense of humor. He did. I mean, to me, that's an American thing where you tell people jokes. <laughs> um, oh. One thing that, one thing that uh, Uchi Amaroshi used to do was after uh, have four cigarettes a day, smoke, four cigarettes a day, one after breakfast, one after lunch, one after dinner, and one before bedtime. Um, and he would do that on the Engawa um, part of the, the, the um, what, what's an Engawa? Um, a porch. Porch uh, yeah. that looks out onto uh, the uh, grounds of Antaiji. And he would uh, sit with us after uh, breakfast, sometimes after lunch as well. Um, and just, just talk with us, maybe there were four or five of us, we're just with him sitting around talking. And <clears throat> sometimes he would be pointing out different flowers that were coming in to bloom. 
um, uh, sometimes um, uh, it, it didn't have to be about uh, any particular practice, but that um, he was he was just with the people that he uh, he was with. <laughs> um, he didn't want to be the Zen master. He he never uh, he never looked like the the, the Zen master. Um, he refused to 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 do that. Um, he, he there were never any trips going on. And during the last two years of his life, he didn't sit a lot. Uh, he couldn't because uh, he was sick um, most of that time, uh, sometimes for three, four months at a time, especially like from about November until March or April. Uh, oftentimes he was he was in bed. Um, and then after he retired and when he was living in Nokein, um, this small temple outside the on the outskirts of Kyoto, uh, where I would visit him. I, I remember one time I visited him uh, and uh, Keiko, his wife, said, oh, come in, come in. And I went in and he was um, in on his uh, stone uh, resting. And we started talking. And after about five minutes, he, he kind of boosted himself up on his elbow and then after about another five minutes he he actually sat up in in bed and then um after about 15 minutes he got up and put on his robe and went went and sat with me in in the next room um in, in seiza um to talk he um, he was incredible in that way. Um, if if you came to see him and you wanted to talk, um, you could. Um, he was that kind of person. I, I didn't um, meet Sawaki Roshi because he, Sawaki Roshi died in 1965. I didn't get to Japan until 67, and I didn't get to. Antaiji until six, the winter of 68, 69, when uh, Shohak-san got there. Um, <clears throat> there, is, um, there is one other uh, person that I, I would like to talk about if it's okay. Um, there was another monk, um, Yokoyama Sodo Roshi, um, who was at Antaiji for a while, I'm not sure how long uh, Arthur would know all the details about that because he, Arthur has translated um, many things of uh, Sodo Roshi's. I, I knew him as Sodo-san. Um, he he um, came to Antaiji for Sawaki Roshi's uh, memorial service uh, every December. And he said, well, Tom, come up and, and visit me in, in Komoro. He, he was living in, um, uh, I think I think it's Nagano-ken uh, or Gifu, Gifu, Gifu Ken uh, prefecture. Um, <clears throat> it was I, Nagano. Okay. Was it Nagano? Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> well, <clears throat> and in March, uh, the following March, I went up to see him uh, and he was, uh, sitting uh, in a, a park above uh, the, the uh, up on the top of the hill above Komuro, and there was a little uh, bamboo grove, and he had um, uh, a little place there. He had a like something like an orange crate and um, a couple of uh, something like cushions, and. First, he took me around the park, and then we, we sat down, and he started talking. That was about 10.30 in the morning. And um, he was talking um, uh, about Yoga Chara. And uh, 
for about, well, from about 10.30 to about 1.30, he was talking just about yoga chara. And it was pretty cool. I was kind of freezing myself, but I I really wanted to hear him. And he would, and he was talking. If I'd ask questions, he would he would always uh, reply as well. Well, about two o'clock, um, he said, "Oh, we forgot about lunch." And from under the table, he he brought out this big uh, rice ball and put it in front of me. And he said, oh, go ahead, please uh, eat. This is for you. And I said, well, but uh, so those are, where's yours? And he said, well, I got mine right here. I'll, I'll, I'll eat mine after I finish uh, talking about yoga chara. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I was famished. So I just grabbed it and I ate the whole rice ball. Well, he went on for about another hour and it was like a little after 3.30. And he, he, um, he said, oh, we got to get you to the, uh, to the station. You got to get back to Kyoto today. So he, he walked me back down the, the hill and uh, I got my ticket and he, he pushes me on the train and I, I get on the train and I sit down and then I start thinking that rice ball that he gave me, that wasn't for me. That was his lunch. He was that kind of person. Uchiyama Roshi was like that too, in that, in a different way from Sodo, uh, Sodo Roshi. But Uchiyama Roshi, his kindness was when people would be coming to see him every day. <clears throat> and not just one or two people, maybe four or five people during the course of the day would be coming to see him. He was, he was talking to psychiatrists, psychologists, um, <clears throat> um, uh, professional people, businessmen, um in all people from all walks of life would come to to see him that was the kind of person that that roshi was um someone remarked to me um after we had uh i had gone to see Ujama roshi with with someone else some the person remarked to me well he he doesn't seem to treat his his wife very well. Um, I wonder why. Well, <clears throat> when we were there, <clears throat> he uh, he said, uh, uh, "Keiko, hot water." It, uh, he he was calling to his wife to bring hot water for tea. Well. It, the person I was with thought he was being kind of uh, rude, but Keiko was also his disciple. He was his wife. She was his wife. She was his wife, but she was also his disciple. And I, I, um, I suspect that uh, he was when people were there, when he would be talking to her, it was like he was talking to a disciple more than to his wife. <clears throat> um, I felt that way uh, the more and more, uh, more times I went to see him <clears throat> when there weren't other people around and Keiko would also come into the room and um, he, he was always very, very kind to her. So I know there's at least one question online. I want to make sure we get to folks' questions. And Sawyer, maybe you can help identify. Somebody had a hand up. We are a virtual almost hand. At, up. Almost at eight, by the way. I know. So this is I was, <laughs> clearly I, I was anticipating we were going to have plenty to say. So those uh, I'm hoping that our three special guests can hang around for a little while, maybe another half an hour. If you can't, I understand. And then you know. Thank you, and people can move on. Uh, but if we can stay, I want to make sure we get to at least the one question that I saw 
earlier, and maybe Sawyer, you can identify and call on. Was it was it Zenshin that had a question? Is that what I saw? If you if you have a question virtually, put put the little yellow hand up so we can find you. Or or unmute yourself and just speak up. <laughs> I know there was somebody. Maybe the person didn't stay. Okay. Well, Alex has a question. Alex, Alex has a question. Let's hear from Alex. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, sharing all those uh, reflections and memories. Um, Daisu, uh, you, you said um, that you went uh, and sat your first session um, and that it was really painful. Um, and you said you were never going to go back. Um, uh, and I understand, um, I think, um, what what that feeling is like. Um, but I'm curious, and I don't, I don't think you said this. If you did, I'm sorry. But what what drew you back? Why did you go back? Um, you said that you had to return to your work for the mission, and then you went back to speak to Uchiyama Roshi. Was it something about him or the place or um, Zazen or what? What was it that? brought you back? That's a good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> prior to, um, of course, um, prior to going to Japan, originally, um, so in the mid-60s, uh, I was with Dr. King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., both in uh, Chicago, uh, and uh, Selma, Alabama. And um, I almost lost my life there. I, I was this kind of dent in my head is from a bullet that I got from a <laughs> a uh, <laughs> policeman in uh, Selma, Alabama. Um, and after that, uh, I um, I uh, transferred. Uh, from Valparaiso University in Indiana there uh, to uh, American University out in Washington, D.C. And while I was in D.C., I became very much involved in the anti-Vietnam -Vietnam War movement. And um, after uh, two years, um, I, uh, I... I felt I couldn't live in America anymore. Um, so I left uh, and that I went to Japan and the only way I could go there at that time uh, was as a, uh, a missionary. Um, I fought the um, uh, county draft board, uh, the state uh, draft board in Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> And um, both of them uh, uh, turned me down uh, four to zero, uh, meaning uh, that I had to go to uh, <clears throat> one of the local uh, army bases or one of the bases in Japan and get a health uh, exam. Um, <clears throat> the um, There was one more you, at that time, uh, there was one more opportunity to appeal, and that was to do a, a presidential appeal, which I did. And at that time, Jerry Ford was president, and I was uh, then exonerated, and, and I didn't have to go into the military after that. Uh, but um, that history is what I carried with me uh, to Antaiji. Um, and the first couple of years, um, uh, um, inequality, discrimination, um, all these things um, were coming up in my in my sitting while I while I was sitting. Uh, That was um, mm, in other words, these the the struggles that I saw going on in in uh, in the society that I had been living in were struggles that I was 
uh, struggling with personally. Um, when I first got involved um, uh, in the civil rights movement, if, <clears throat> uh, I went to Chicago. Uh, I was working as a um, uh, a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, leader in the church uh, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, the, the congregation was uh, mostly white and over 65 or 70 years of age. Um, there were a few younger people who were uh, black. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, black women um, uh, invited me to join um, SCLC. That was Reverend King's uh, organization. Uh, and so I did. Um, those um, uh, experiences uh, made me wonder, um, made me question um, my own value as a human being. Um, it, it wasn't just um, that I was against discrimination against other people of, of another color. Um, <clears throat> the first time I met uh, the youth group in the church uh, there in Chicago, um, they said, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from uh, a small town in, in Wisconsin. Um, there weren't any um, uh, people of color um, in, in my small town, um, but I have nothing against people of color. Well, when the kids heard me say that, they burst out in incredible laughter fell on the floor laughing at me. After they finished laughing, they sat me down and they said, well, for the next six months, we'll teach you about your prejudices. And they did. And they, um, uh, in a loving way, but let me know uh, about the prejudices that I held that I had and didn't know. I took that to Japan as well and sat with that too. Um, uh, and increasingly began to question my own value as a human being. The senior monk uh, at Antaiji, whom I mentioned earlier, um, let me know in no uncertain terms that I was um, buck up. Uh, I was, I was, I had no value. I was just a useless person. Um, and that got to me after about. Uh, and I'm in my mid thirties again. In my mid forties, um, I uh, I did contemplate suicide um, because I thought I had lost. Um, I had no value as a human being. But despite that, I continued to sit, and I continued to uh, talk with Uchiha Roshi. And um, I think one in, in, in my mid forties, it, it probably took me about a half a year uh, before I felt I could um, talk with people. Um, I just um, felt worthless. Um, but uh, I think probably more than anyone else, Uchiyama Roshi, uh, as, as well as um, Sodo Roshi, uh, encouraged me uh, to 
also question question my own questioning about uh, being valuable or not valuable. And so I kept I kept sitting. Um, and I think, uh, no, uh, I, I'm sure of it. Um, sitting saved my life. Um, that's about all I could say. <laughs> sitting saved my life. We have at least two more questions online. I want to make sure we get to one of them was uh, somebody is wondering about Uchem Roshi's practice related to engaged, what we would call today engaged Buddhism. And you're just coming out of stories about your involvement in Selma and other places. So what was what's your impression, you or any of our three guests, about Uchiyama Roshi's practice related to engaged Buddhism? Um, okay. Okay. What he, I, I talked to him about um, Reverend King and, and my experiences there in the States before I came to Japan. And he said, um, Uchiha Maroshi uh, said, uh, <coughs> if, if, you, if you feel like you have to do something like that, be in, engaged in some way, um, go ahead and, and do that. Um, but um, ultimately, um when you when we sit we sit with the whole world we're sitting with those problems and we're settling them by sitting sitting is a settling of those problems do we see it no no i wish we could but no uh, they're not something that we can uh, see with with our eyes or or understand mentally. It, it's not that. Um, sitting um, for me is much is well. One word um, that comes to mind is surrender. Um, Uchiha Maroshi used the word um, sanzen very frequently. This san, sanzen means uh, to can mean to come to to Zen, come to sitting sanzen. Some people think of sanzen as the student coming to meet the teacher. But Uchiha Maroshi took it to a completely different level. Um, the word um, San also uh, the one of the readings is mairu meaning to give up or to surrender. So uh, for Uchamaroshi, sanzen meant uh, uh, surrendering to our sitting, surrendering to Zen. I don't know if that makes sense to many people, but. Thank you. That gives us something to to noodle on. Uh, and I want to get to this other question from uh, someone who wants to know: Did Uchiyama Roshi know Shunryu Suzuki Roshi? That's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is: Did he have any Rinzai Zen Roshi friends, or what was his view of Rinzai practice? Okay. Um, Suzuki Shunryu Roshi came to Antaiji uh, to see. Uh, Uchiyama Roshi, and um, they had a, a very good talk. Um, later, Uchiyama Roshi said, "Yeah, um, he's uh, he's. I'm sure he's doing uh, very well. Uh, a good thing there in in the states." Um, the only thing he thought uh, that Uchiyama Roshi thought about Suzuki Roshi was it was unfortunate that he didn't have more uh, Japanese disciples. Um, that was one thing uh, he mentioned. Um, after uh, Suzuki Roshi and uh, Uchiyama Roshi talked, Suzuki Roshi came into the other room where a number of us were uh, waiting uh, to uh, 
to talk with him or actually we were waiting to uh, hear what he had to say. And he, he sat down in, in front of us and kind of looked around and, and um, said nothing. Then he said, well, he said, I don't have anything to say, but if you have a question, I'd be happy to address your question. And that's when <laughs> everyone's hand started popping up and, and we asked uh, many questions of him at the time. Um, that was the one encounter I had with uh, Suzuki Shungi Roshi. That was uh, in the, I, maybe it was in the fall um, uh, fall of the, and he, he died in December of that same year. Um, so he, he wasn't, he didn't live much longer than, uh, than the time he had come to Ontaiji. What was the other half of that question? So the other half of that question was whether or not Uchiha Maroshi had friends who were in the Rinzai tradition or what his view was of the whole Rinzai practice tradition. Um, he he uh, knew and admired uh, Shibayama Zenke, and I, um, Michael didn't didn't they meet once or um, I'm at at Antaiji? I'm not sure. Uh, Michael would know that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't part of the conversation. Though. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, when you, you, you uh, Michael came to um, uh, uh, Antaiji uh, after you had been with uh, Shibayama Zenke, right? Well, I met uh, Shibayama Zenke in, in California. Oh, in California. It was in California that you met him. That's yeah. right. And then I went to Japan to see him again. Yeah. And I, I know um, Uchiha Maroshi also thought quite highly of him. Yeah. Uchiha Maroshi wasn't big on on the koan practice. He, he, he didn't encourage that much. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if he... He thought that it, it it wasn't worthwhile because it was churning people would people getting their mind all churned up and turned around, which is not in itself a bad thing. Um, but uh, if you once you get on this koan thing and you begin to think, oh, I'm uh, I'm becoming more enlightened, more enlightened, more enlightened, more enlightened, then I think you make a big mistake. Um, you, you become too much attached to your, your own enlightenment uh, and forget um, that um, we're, we're living with with everything and everyone. And um, our practice is one of the attitude with which we sit is the attitude that we have to, that has to carry over into our day-to-day -day life. That's where compassion comes out. It, <clears throat> Um, if we sit with an attitude that, um, well, screw everyone else, I'm, I'm just going to sit zazen, um, then I don't think we have a, a very good understanding of, of, of our practice a, as a whole. Um, Uchiha Maroshi emphasized sitting, for sure, without a doubt. Um, and I think um, uh, Okumura Roshi is doing has has done just that um, uh, more than any other disciple of Uchiha Roshi. 
that I know of. Um, uh, and I hope um, uh, that uh, all of you in, in Indiana can uh, carry on um, that uh, tradition, not just as a tradition, but as your own personal practice. Um, and that that practice <clears throat> may carry over into your daily life as compassion. Good, thank you for that. Um, so we do have one more question and someone, I know you Daitsu have said you did not meet Sawaki Roshi. I wonder if our other two guests have met Sawaki Roshi because the question is about whether you had a meeting with, with him. Did either of the other two folks get to meet him? No. No, okay. So you can't, uh, so the three of you can't speak directly to the difference in personality between Kota Sawaki uh, and Kosha Uchiyama, but maybe if either any of the three of you have some thoughts about that, our questioner is interested in sort of the difference of personality between these two teachers. Arthur? Unmute. <laughs> I don't know if he's here anymore. Arthur is lurking. I think he's disappeared. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I hear something. Okay. What do you think, Michael? Um, I think we should get Arthur in here. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Arthur, hey, you're uh, you gotta undo your um, mute. <laughs> Down in the uh, very corner. Um, no, I think I get the impression the microphone, like, like you're in a troll or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there he is. Oh, oh there, yeah. there he is. All right, there you go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he comes and he goes. All things are impermanent. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh good. You can do it, Arthur. <laughs> yeah, he's he's reconnect. There he goes. He's reconnecting the audio. Okay, Arthur, yes. can you hear us? Are you there? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. So, do you have some thoughts about this difference of personality between? Sawaki Roshi and Uchiyama Roshi? I think when they... Oh. <laughs> it's not meant to be. <laughs> there he is. I think it's, as they got older, they got very similar to each other. When they were mm -hmm. younger, Sawaki was a tough guy. I don't know if Uchiyama Roshi was ever tough. Mm -hmm. was, uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Uchiyama Roshi learned a lot from Suwaki and most mo most of what he said I think came from what he learned from Suwaki that's about all you can say um Shohak well I don't want to bring it into it but Shohak did a lot of research on Suwaki so he could probably tell you better than I can <laughs> he, but he was I think he was a very special person and most people that knew him probably felt that too. He was very careful with, he wasn't as. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so Arthur has disappeared. There he is. Okay. I see we've got two more um, online questions here. Maybe Sawyer, you can kind of reveal what those are for There's us. one from uh, Gilbutsuji. Okay, good. Gilbutsuji, yes. There we go. Okay, there. Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone and the ones that organize or makes the uh, this event. Um, I have a question to Daitsu, since Daitsu, it's fine. Um, like when uh, you said that um, Ushiyama Roshi at his 81 years, said that he starts to understand a little bit about Buddha Dharma. 
um, this kind, I have like two contradict impressions. Like one impression is like, wow, that's kind of beauty. Uh, but also this occurs to me a little bit. Um, so I, I, I don't know if my, <laughs> I don't know if my English is well, I hope it's makes some sense what I'm saying, but I would like to know, like, what is your understanding, uh, Daitsu, about uh, Uchiyama's Roshi um, a statement about that he's starting to understand Buddha Dharma at his 81 years old, a little bit. You want to know uh, what his attainment? What was so, that question? Yeah. So earlier, earlier on, Daitsu uh, mentioned that uh, one of the interactions he had with Uchiyama Roshi, Uchiyama Roshi said, I'm 81 and I'm only now starting to understand Buddha Dharma. Yeah. So this question from the folks at Gyobutsuji is a follow-up to that comment. So Daitsu, do you have, uh, in our remaining seven minutes or so, do you have something you'd like to say about that? Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> as far as um, Sawaki and Uchiyama Roshi are uh, concerned, <clears throat> if I had gone to Antaiji when Sawaki Roshi was there, I doubt very much whether I would ever have gone back. Uh, I think he he was, um, according to Uchiyama Roshi, um, quite a curmudgeon. Um, he was he was really hard on on Uchiyama um, regarding um, his understanding, only beginning to understand Buddhism at eighty one. Um, It's because, he, he, I think he, he didn't say that because uh, un, until he was 81, he didn't understand anything about Buddhism. It was only that our, our practice is, um, is, is deep and it's always, it's always getting deeper. Um, it, it, it's not something that you get to a certain level. There, there, there's no levels. We just um, so maybe for Uchiyama, the person himself, maybe he did feel that way. But for for people like me who um, were with him for twenty five years. It, um, he was talking about the depth of practice, um, and that and that there there's there's no end to how deep we can our our, our practice can be. Um, if if our uh, our practice remains in the zendo, and once we walk out the zendo. Um, we, we leave it all behind, then um, I think our practice is still pretty shallow. That attitude with which we sit, as I said earlier, uh, has to uh, uh, continue uh, th throughout our, our daily life in terms of the way we, uh, we, we treat uh, people and the way we treat ourselves, the way we treat ourselves as well. Um, th that would be my response to your question. Good. I, I don't know if it resonates so, at all. Thank you. So that's where we need to leave it for today. We're now uh, very close to 8.30. So uh, I'm gonna thank our three special guests. Uh, for helping us to understand our practice. As we say here, sometimes, you know, we need to practice our understanding and understanding our practice. Uh, so I hope we've made a little bit of movement toward that. Uh, so I hope this is not the last of these conversations that we have. Clearly, there's lots of interest 
Uh, in hearing the stories, you know, and uh, hearing directly from folks who have practiced with Uchi Amaroshi. If you had a question and you didn't get a chance to ask your question, you're welcome to forward that to us. Uh, we will maybe try to get those things answered or continue the conversation in some way, because it seems like we're interested in doing that. So clearly this is an important part of our own uh, practice here, investigating our own lineage and legacy. So thank you to everybody who participated online. Thanks to our three guests. Uh, in their various time zones. This was not easy for them. They did some arranging to get with us today. Thanks to our folks who've um, engaged with us here. And uh, please watch our website, newsletter, etc. for perhaps where this recording will end up so that you can watch it again and share with your friends. Thanks everybody for your practice. Please have a good evening. <laughs> uh -huh.